the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the church which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the Apostate Church of the Book of Revelation. Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. This one's called Another Gospel, Conversion to Christ, and deals with chapter 20 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian about the ecumenical movement. We have been almost through the complete book. Chapter 20 is the one but last chapter, and it's a quite short one, so I'm very much looking forward to finish this book and go on to the next book reading that I will present to you after this is completely uploaded. Chapter 20, another gospel, on page 202, if you follow along in your own copy of the book. We are living in a challenging time for Christians, a time of massive indifference to the gospel across society. Liberal Christianity, which denies the great truths of the faith, higher criticism and the new hermeneutic among theologians, the rapid rise of Islam, and other world religions, the growth of the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses and the other cults, as well as the advance of multi-faith religion and the formidable New Age movement, all these are absorbing the spiritual firepower of God's people. There are so many battles to fight and so many enemies to face that, understandably, Followers of Christ are eager to join with those who have firm beliefs on the virgin birth and the resurrection and who also hold to clear biblical positions on the great issues of social concern. Now here I have to make a comment. The author says there are so many battles to fight and so many enemies to face. No, Ralph, for a true uh, Ralph, I say. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Michael, the author, Michael the Semlian. There are not so many enemies to face. There actually only is one enemy. And this book, among others, helped us identify the enemy. The enemy is Satan. And represented is Satan on the earth through the Antichrist. That is the enemy. The problem is that especially in the world that we are living in today, 2016, because he writes here in 1993 about the rapid rise of Islam and other world religions, but what do we have today with ISIS all over the world and the refugees coming all over Europe and all over the United States of America and so-called, yeah, making us or giving us so-called new enemies? No, 
no no the enemy always was and always is and always will be the same the roman catholic church hierarchy system the antichrist not the individual catholics understand that because the most most of the catholics are really jesus loving nice people and they only want to be like bible believing christians but they are caught in the lie they are caught in the trap the roman catholic system set up for them and some didn't even have a chance because they were never taught something else so don't stir hatred against catholics but hatred and exposure against the catholic system and that is the only enemy so when the author says there are so many battles to fight and so many enemies to face no there's only one enemy and once you've disguised him you know that all the others are just puppets working for this one enemy and you can concentrate on loving all these people loving the muslims loving the catholics loving the buddhists loving the hinduists loving even the atheists because very very sure to believe not in something is to believe that you believe in nothing that's also a belief right so we have to turn ourselves away from hatred of course because the normal feeling that you have when you know there is an enemy is that you hate your enemy jesus said love your enemy and do good to them that hate you and when the author says that there are so many enemies no there's only one enemy and we have to face him we have to face him in this world and we have to face him in the spiritual world because we are not fighting against, fle against flesh and blood but against powers and spiritual uh, spiritual wickedness in high places as the bible says but okay i'm gonna read the whole sentence to you but please understand that i absolutely do not agree with so many enemies no there's only one enemy there's one adversary of christ and that's the antichrist and of course the whole system that represents him here on earth so there are so many battles to fight and so many enemies to face that understandably followers of christ are eager to join with those who have firm beliefs on the virgin birth and the resurrection and who also hold to clear biblical positions on the great issues of social concern. The charismatic movement, with its healings and other signs and wonders, ah, with its impressive unity among denominations and apparent warmth and joy among so many of those involved, seems to be empowered to fight the good fight. But the parables of Matthew 13, those of the sower and of the wheat and the tares, remind us that the church just isn't like this. All is not as it seems. The majority who make commitments with joy grow no roots, succumb to the comforts and lures of the world, and fall away usually only when the going gets difficult. They may continue to feature strongly in the church. Praise, pray and prophesy, but they seek to serve both the world and God. In Matthew 7, verse 14, we read, Narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. The pastoral implications of all this for individuals and for the churches are clearly sensitive and invidious. The challenge in the closing years, because we are living in the end times and Satan knows that he only has a short time, of this century and of course the new century, the 21st that we are living in today, and millennium for Protestants is to reassert biblical truth and to proclaim the need for a new reformation. That is why Tom Fress is so busy with Inquisition Update, wanting to rekindle the spark of reformation in America, where he does his program. And for me, the same. I want to rekindle the spark of the reformation that once was there when Luther 
started the Reformation on the German ground. And so there are Protestants. It is to, uh, uh, um, the challenge in the closing years of this century and the starting years of this century we are living in when I read this. And the millennium for Protestants is to reassert biblical truths and to proclaim the need for a new Reformation. Holy Spirit revival is the earnest prayer of every God-fearing church. The need for repentance before God and for the forthright opposing <coughs> and for the forthright opposing of false doctrine with scriptural truth is generally acknowledged. Martin Lloyd Jones, who was greatly burdened for those trapped within the sacramental and sacerdotal system, felt that only when sound biblical doctrine came together with experience of the power and gifts given by the Spirit could the balance be right. He was deeply troubled by a dry, intellectual, critical and fearful Christianity which rejected all experience and the fullness of God's provision by His Spirit. For him, both reformation and renewal were needed for revival. They absolutely are. The power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit should not be denied simply because the counterfeit is so widespread. Those who, like Dr. Lloyd-Jones, believe in God's sovereignty over the provision of spiritual gifts are concerned that too many churches, fearful of deception, are prone to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The charismatic renewal has brought many to a knowledge of the word of God but all too rarely with the reverence that is due to a God who is holy. Spiritual discernment is scarce. Tolerance towards the teaching of those that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, as we can read in Galatians chapter 1, verse 7, is a feature of our times. Might such tolerance be a denial of pastoral responsibility? Believers have to face up to the rising influence of another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, as we can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. What is called for is more clarity, more discernment, and more vigilance, either to decide to please men or to please God, and choose to publicly endorse or deny Roman Catholicism. In opposing error, we must make clear the crucial distinction between Roman Catholicism and Roman Catholics, the religious system on the one hand and the people within it on the other hand. There simply isn't any middle ground. There are no grey zones. There is whether light or there is darkness. There is whether truth or there is lie. There simply isn't any middle ground. Catholics themselves have ever been crystal clear about that. Quote, the Roman Church is either the masterpiece of Satan or the kingdom of the Son of God, unquote, insisted Cardinal Manning. His contemporary and colleague Cardinal Newman was just as empathetic. Quote, a sacerdotal order of priesthood is historically the essence of the Church of Rome. If not divinely appointed, it is doctrinally the essence of Antichrist. Unquote. And we can read for that again in the much from me venerated book of Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness, Romanism and the Reformation. I'm going to read these two quotes to you once again because they are so profound to be correctly understood. The Roman Church is either the masterpiece of Satan or the kingdom of the Son of God. And Cardinal Newman said, a sacerdotal order is historically the essence of the Church of Rome. If not divinely appointed, it is doctrinally the essence of Antichrist. End of both quotes. And I personally think that these are very, very important quotes that everybody should remember. To facilitate in today's climate with such strong ecumenical current flowing is to appear to endorse Rome's errors. 
Not to speak out is to deny the truth to all those in the Anglican and Catholic Church are still entangled in the man-made bondage of ritualism and depending on the sacraments and the priesthoods for the grace of God. And appearing alongside prominent Roman Catholics at conferences and in ecumenical enterprises, even merely as a name on the notepaper, evangelical leaders are effectively endorsing unscriptural beliefs. The New Testament is as clear as the Old about separation. Quote from Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 we read, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Dr. Francis Schaeffer thought that in facing up to this issue, quote, three choices exist. Unloving confrontation, no confrontation, and loving confrontation. Only the third is biblical, unquote. Those leaders in the church who understand the problem and its dangers, and who excuse themselves saying, this is not my particular calling, or, oh, the timing is not right, are not in accord with the scriptures. As the much-respected Bible commentator, commentator Matthew Henry said, quote, evil abounds when good men stay silent. Attitudes to individual Roman Catholics, a very important part of this finishing part of the book. To confront the error is not to condemn the person. Leading Protestant protagonist and watchman Albert Close, writing in the 1940s, represented the view of evangelical Christianity when he declared, quote, the author believes and unhesitatingly acknowledges that many Roman Catholics are real children of God. They have believed on Christ in spite of all the mystic pagan rites, ceremonies and doctrines under which the priesthood has buried the truth. They are better than their creed. Millions of them and millions of them are in heaven today. Some, like Bernard of Clairvaux, have been God's choicest spirits. But the papal religious system, which has imprisoned the truth and unrighteousness, is the devil's travesty on divine truth. God does care whether man worships in a right or in a wrong and even forbidden way. God's fiercest anger with old Israel was aroused because Israel would persist in worshipping in a wrong and forbidden way, setting up images and bowing down before them. Unquote. We can read that in the Divine Program of the World's History by A. Close. To question the salvation of individual Catholics, especially those baptized in the Spirit, in the renewal is sure to be seen as bigoted and sectarian. But California's Bill Jackson of Christians Evangelizing Catholics argues, quote, To tell the truth is not bigotry or hatred. If you hated someone who is lost, you would leave them alone and let them go to hell. Unquote. Charismatics are right to say that truth without love is bigotry, but love without truth is whoredom, says Protestant publisher Jack Chick, another Californian. And what does Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments, as we can read in John 14, verse 15. If you love those in error, you will tell them the truth. Quote, preach the word, be instant in and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Unquote, as we can read in 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 2. If you love those in error, you will tell them the truth. Yeah, and love without truth is whoredom. Advising individuals tied to the sacraments for the remission of their sins about the true nature of faith 
they have pursued for much of their lives requires special sensitivity, discernment and knowledge, as well as much prayer. However, those who are truly converted and who continue to participate in the Mass, and in what was until recently known as the confessional, and in prayers to the Virgin Mary and the saints, are sure to feel uncomfortable as their understandings and as their understanding is quickened by Holy Scripture. That's what we have to do. We have to give these people the Scripture. We have to convince them that not the Roman Catholic Catechism is the truth they should read for getting to know Jesus Christ and getting saved, but to read his true and uncorrupted word, the Bible. The good news, conversion to Christ, is the last part of this chapter called. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus differentiates between religion and saving faith, as we can read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Quote, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in there that. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Unquote. Good works, the sacraments and baptism are an expression of the life of Christ within us and our love for Christ, but they play no part in our salvation. This is absolutely necessary to understand. The Roman Catholic Church exactly teaches the opposite. Good words, the sacraments and baptism are necessary for your salvation is what the Church preaches. Good words, the sacraments and baptism are an expression of the life of Christ within us and our love for Christ and they play no part in our salvation. That is biblical teaching. That is what we have to get out. It is impossible to please God and earn grace in any of these ways. God is holy and he must judge sin. As we can read in Romans 3, verses 10 and 23, quote, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, unquote. So, my dear listener, there is no original sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is what the Bible preaches and no original sin as the Roman Catholic Church preaches and therefore not necessary child baptism. Baptism is only an outward sign to show that I have been saved. It is not a saving aspect. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And only when I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, I can be saved by Him through grace, in faith, alone, in Jesus Christ. That's the point. All of us are deserving of His judgment. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being raised in a Christian home won't make us a Christian, nor will church attendance, nor indeed will baptism and confirmation or participation in communion. What then is the answer? What makes a Christian? Luther, formidable in intellect, on spiritual self-discipline, long strived and searched in vain for the narrow road that leads to life. The Spirit of Jesus, the living Lord, led him to the answer in the Scriptures. The just shall live by faith, wrote Paul to the Christians in Rome, and a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Our salvation is simply a gift. Out of the amazing grace of God, we are freely forgiven. We can't earn it. Boasting is excluded. 
for by grace are ye saved, and not by works, for that any man should boast. Right? It is a free gift of God. People should not ask themselves, why does God allow so many people to die in this world? People should ask themselves why people do not accept the free gift of eternal life from our f Heavenly Father. That's the question we should ask ourselves. The just shall live by faith, and the man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Our salvation is simply a gift. Out of the amazing grace of God we are freely forgiven. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son to die for us, for our sins, so that we, when we believe in him, can have eternal life. Isn't that a wonderful love? Isn't that a wonderful Father for all of us? Giving us the free gift because we can't do anything because we are born in trespasses and sins. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he gives us freely, without any strings attached, the gift of salvation. The only thing we have to do is to accept it. And there is the difference with the Roman Catholic Church, who, which teaches that you can get salvation through your works. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that through your good works you can make God a debtor to you. Because of your good works he is indebted to you to give you eternal life. That's not how it works. The creator of this world will not be indebted to anyone. The blessed assurance of personal salvation depends entirely on a wonderful historical fact. Christ died on the cross as the perfect Passover lamb, a sacrifice once and for all time for our sins. He died for us, and we die with him to sin and self. Quote, Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Unquote. As we can read in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. We rise again with him into new life by the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. Quote, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Unquote. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus told Nicodemus, a leader among the Sanhedrin, and like the unconverted Luther, well versed in theology and religion, that he needed to be born again of water and the Spirit, as we can read in John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5. We cannot approach God on our terms, nor through our intellects. <laughs> he has given us our intellect in the first place. For, quote, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Unquote. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Our approach to God must be as a little child before our Heavenly Father, because, quote, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Unquote. As we can read in Luke chapter 18, verse 17. And this is what I repeatedly said in my videos. Be like a little child. What does that mean? That means that we have to free our brain from everything indoctrinated in this world when we approach the Word of God, when we approach the Bible. And whoever is able to do that and will read the Bible without any pre uh, pre uh, pre without being presumptuous or whatever in that, you know, without any, um, how do you say that, without any prejudice, you have to uh, you have to approach the bible without prejudice without anything taught before like a little child and then you will receive it like a little child and then you will receive all truth very very easily but put away everything that is so called taught to you by men and open yourself to the word of god 
Now the book ends here with uh, information on uh, and advice concerning personal salvation and um, I also have something to say about that. Londoner Ralph Brockman, a man of prayer and member of Intercessors for Britain, recalls, quote, For many years I was on that broad road, attending an Anglo-Catholic church and I had difficulty understanding the matter of justification by faith and why Jesus died on the cross. I knew there was a heaven and a hell. I wanted to go to heaven, but was trying to earn my salvation. I then used the following prayer, as Ralph Brockman states here in this book. Quote, O Lord, I am a sinner, and I am sorry for my sins. I am willing to turn from my sins. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I confess Him as Lord. I want to serve Him from this moment on in the fellowship of His Church. In Christ's name, Amen. That was the prayer of Ralph Brockman. And the prayer that I used some time ago to my salvation and my acceptance of Jesus Christ goes as, as follows. Lord, I believe that Jesus died on the cross as my personal representative. He wore all my guilt, all my sins, all my shame and all my condemnation. He died in my place and he rose from the dead. Because I believe this, your word tells me that the righteousness of Christ is now imputed unto me and I receive it now as a free gift. Not by struggling, not by striving, but by believing. I believe in my heart and declare with my mouth that through faith in Christ I am justified, made righteous, just as I never sinned. Amen. Whether you use the words that Ralph Brockman used in his prayer, or you use the words that I just use, or you use your own words, when they come right out of your heart, they will do the job. You have to accept Jesus Christ from the bottom of your heart, from the bottom of your soul. And then you follow the Ten Commandments not because you want to be saved, but because you are saved. And that will also end any discussion that you could ever have on the fourth commandment. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. All ten of them. Right? So whenever you have struggle, accepting that there are ten commandments that Jesus gave us, that means that the right spirit is not in you. Simple as that. This was chapter 20 of All Roads Lead to Rome called Another Gospel and Conversion to Christ and leaves us with only chapter 1. Who are these Protestants on page 208 of the book All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian on the ecumenical movement to read for the next time? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for watching the video, for listening, understanding, for commenting, uh, for being here. God bless you. Until next time, Jogna 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. Bye bye. We as Bible-believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al-Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us 
and Matthew 24. There will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take the information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way maybe they have a way to find to the real truth I mean these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called quote-unquote Christian countries of course the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian of course the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore all right I know that but still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.